It is good to be with you tonight. I hope you're all doing well, and uh, we are looking forward to being together this coming Sunday morning at 9.30 for Bible class. We are continuing our study through the book of 1 Timothy, so I'm looking forward to being with you for that and then for worship at 10.30. If you have any questions about that, let me know, but I am uh, looking forward to seeing all of you this coming Sunday, if the Lord wills. Tonight, we are wrapping up our brief series of lessons on prophecy in the Bible. We're just hitting the highlights, and this is uh, number eight in a series of eight lessons, so we're doing something of an overview. This is in between our study of Acts and our study of the book of Genesis. And this is something of a buffer between those two rather large books. So that's what we've been doing over the past several weeks. And to help keep us on track, we've got the outline over on the left side of the screen there. We started with the basics. We defined some terms, noting that a prophet is a spokesperson, somebody speaking on God's behalf, and a number of times uh, they have the ability to foretell the future. And that's what we've been focusing on in this series of lessons, predictive prophecies. Uh, then we looked at some principles of predictive prophecy. We looked at a number of examples. That's been the bulk of our study over the past several weeks. We've looked at national prophecies, some prophecies concerning individuals. We looked at some prophecies concerning the Lord's kingdom, the church. And then over the past few weeks, we've looked at some prophecies concerning Jesus. And up to this point, we've looked at his birth, we've looked at his life and his ministry, we've looked at the final week of his life on this earth before the crucifixion. Last week, we looked at that and focused in on his betrayal and the trial and some principles there from the Old Testament. And tonight, we plan on concluding this study by looking at some of the prophecies concerning Jesus' death and his resurrection. So I want us to start tonight, if we could, by going together to... Psalm number 22. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Psalm number 22. I'll try to put it on the screen here. I know not all of you are able to see that, but we'll be looking at Psalm number 22. We'll break this into a few chunks here. Uh, some have suggested that some of the references here almost sound as if the author was standing nearby as he wrote this song, as if he, as if he was a, a an eyewitness to the crucifixion. So uh, we're not going to read the entire psalm. We'll focus on the first 18 verses with half on this screen and half on the next. But let's look together starting in Psalm number 22, verse number 1. And I think it'll be very familiar to us from the very beginning. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy, O oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip, they wag the head saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help Many bulls have surrounded me, strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death." For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance, deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. From the horns of the wild oxen you answer me. I will tell of your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. 
Well, to study the prophecy part of this passage, I want to go back and note uh, some of the more obvious prophecies I think we would say would be fulfilled in the resurrection and in the uh, death of Jesus on the cross. And we'll get to the resurrection in a little bit. Uh, obviously, to most of us, at least Psalm 22, 1 and 2 is pretty familiar. This is the uh, passage Jesus quotes as he was hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as I understand it, since the Bible wasn't divided into chapters and verses at that time, and it wouldn't be for hundreds of years later, uh, whenever a teacher wanted to have you turn to a certain passage, he would often quote the first line of that passage. And so he couldn't say, turn to Psalm 22, verse 1. They didn't have those divisions yet. And so he would quote the first line of the passage. So by quoting Psalm 22, 1, this was maybe the Lord's way of saying on the cross, would you please turn with me to Psalm 22? It's on page 688 in our Pew Bibles kind of thing, as we would say today. And so that seems to be what's going on here, especially since so much of the rest of this chapter seems to be fulfilled in the, in the uh, crucifixion. And so it's almost as if Jesus is saying, pay attention to what you see here today and compare it to what was written back in Psalm 22. And I think he was saying by quoting those first uh, that first line there, think about this because I am the fulfillment of this passage. That's the way many people would uh, would take this based on the practice of the time. And to me, this may be relevant in our discussion of what this statement actually means. I know a lot of times we read these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we want to know was Jesus actually forsaken by his Father? Did God the Father actually turn his back on God the Son? Was there this uh, split or this separation in the Godhead at this moment? And is that even possible? Um, or was he saying that he felt forsaken? Why have you forsaken me? Why do I feel as if I've been forsaken? So that's the big discussion, I think, a lot of times when we get to this passage. And I think there are some good arguments on both sides. Uh, but the other thing to consider here is that he was quoting this passage or this statement as a statement. And again, telling people, go look this up. So turn to this psalm, look at these words written by King David, and compare what you read there uh, to what you are witnessing here today. And I believe any Jewish rabbi, many others who were knowledgeable in the scriptures, they would get it. And they would certainly know the rest of this chapter, probably by heart. And Jesus, by quoting the first line of this chapter, uh, was uh, primarily redirecting their attention to this psalm and encouraging them to compare what they read with what they were seeing right there in front of their eyes. Um, I have the quote from Matthew 27, 46 through 50 on the screen up here. I don't think we need to read it. I, I would just note that uh, due to Jesus speaking this in Aramaic and due to the fact that we have several languages being spoken almost simultaneously back and forth at Golgotha, you know, very international city at this time. You got the Romans coming in from obviously Italy. You got the Latin, you got Greek, you got uh, Hebrew, you got Aramaic, the common uh, Jewish dialect at that time. And due to the fact that Jesus is in excruciating pain, due to the fact that he's up on the cross, lifted up in the air, due to the fact that there is some uh, physical distance going on here, uh, some of those in the crowd think that he's calling out for Elijah. So if you can imagine that they hear him calling out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And so there is some confusion as to what he's actually said. And so they give him this sour wine and the sponge on a stick, and he accepts it even though he had turned down that drink that they'd offered him a little bit earlier. And so this is apparently right near, uh, right near the end. Well, the obvious fulfillment, uh, the next one at least, comes with reference to verses 7 and 8 where David says, all who see me sneer at me, they separate with the lip, they wag the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord and let him deliver him, let him rescue him because he delights in him. Well, I mean, I think we understand if we know the scriptures at all, if we turn over to Luke 23, 35 through 37, uh, that's where Luke says, and the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. 
The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. So I think we see that uh, verses 7 and 8 in Psalm 22 are certainly fulfilled in his death there on the cross. Uh, we have another brief series of prophecies, skipping down to verses 16 through 18, as we just read them a few moments ago. For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Obviously, we have a lot of things going on just in that short series of verses. So we uh, turn over to John 2, 25, for example. John says, So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. Uh, but he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And, uh, of course, this is Thomas, after the resurrection, looking back on it, just the reference to uh, nail prints in his hands and in his feet. Uh, but it's just amazing to me that David talks about uh, hands and feet being pierced, uh, when this would have been incredibly unusual, especially as a cause of death or contributing to it. I mean, crucifixion wasn't even invented as a form of capital punishment until several hundred years later by the Persians. The Romans then perfected it, we might say. Um, but uh, many, many years after David wrote these words. Uh, verse 17 is unusual as well. I don't think it stands on its own in that this verse itself proves uh, too much, but combined with the others, it's rather interesting. David refers to counting all of his bones. Uh, other translations refer to his bones being on display or visible. Uh, we have secular accounts suggesting that a Roman flogging would often expose the bones as uh, flesh was ripped away, so you'd see the white bones sticking out of the flesh at that point. Uh, verse 17 also refers to people staring at him, and we saw this in that last passage, just referring back to Luke 23, with the crowds described as standing by and looking on. So obviously Jesus was a spectacle. Uh, anybody in the area, it was one of those things where it'd be hard to take your eyes away from it. Just uh, so so completely terrible, so awful. Uh, but people were there staring and they just couldn't look away from it. Uh, then down in verse 18, we've got the reference to his garments being divided and people casting lots for his clothing. And obviously that uh, is fulfilled in his death on the cross. This is where we come to John 19 verses 23 through 25. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece, so they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. So I hope we notice that. Just a very, very direct fulfillment of that prophecy. And again, totally random. These soldiers are not reading Psalm 22 thinking, okay, what do we need to do next here? The next on the checklist is uh, divide his clothing. We can't tear this one up, but we have to gamble over it. You know, no, they, they were not using Psalm 22 as a guide. Uh, but rather, King David, as a prophet himself, saw this off in the distant future, and he wrote about it, and it was fulfilled perfectly uh, in the gospel record. In addition to Psalm 22, we have several other prophecies in the book of Psalms, and I would have us turn over briefly to Psalm 34 for another one of these, if you're able to do that. This is Psalm 34 verses 17 through 20. So I know Psalm 22 was long and we just had one after the other. Then we have several sporadic Psalms popping up with uh, seeming prophecies. So this is Psalm 34 verses 17 through 20. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Well, that's a, an interesting reference, isn't it? And, um, you know, reading that for the first time, if you don't know anything about the New Testament, they may think, oh, that's interesting. Uh, but then we come over and we see it very obviously fulfilled in John chapter 19. So I'm going to read John chapter 19, verses 31 through 36. And notice the fulfillment and the quoting of this psalm by John the Apostle. John 19, 31 through 36. Then the Jews, 
Because it was the day of preparation so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked that Pilate, uh, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other one who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his uh, testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may... Uh, you also may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. So I notice, uh, hope we notice what happened there. We have this prophecy seemingly random in Psalm 34, and then it is fulfilled in John 19, and John points that out actually by quoting from this psalm. And of course the practice was uh, crucifixion could go on for days, and as I understand it, uh, not just blood loss and exposure would be the cause of death, but often it was asphyxiation. Uh, with not being able to exhale. So you'd have to pull up on those nails, pushing with your feet uh, in order to exhale. Otherwise, uh, you'd just be constantly inhaling, couldn't get any breath out, and so the person would basically suffocate as a cause of death on the cross. Well, to uh, speed that up, uh, the practice was to come by and break the legs, and then they could no longer push up to exhale. Then they would uh, very well, rather quickly die at that point. So, so the uh, two criminals were still alive. Maybe they hadn't been flogged as Jesus had been, and so they lasted a bit longer. Jesus, though, started on the cross absolutely crushed and worn out and uh, wasn't able to make it as long as they did. So he was already dead, and so there was no need to uh, break his legs. And uh, again, the soldiers weren't using Psalm 34 as a guide saying, oh, we can't break this guy's legs. The Bible says we can't. That's not the case at all. Uh, but instead, he was already dead and they didn't need to do that. And so they didn't. And uh, totally unknowingly uh, to them, they perfectly fulfilled that prophecy going back to Psalm number 34. Um, in Exodus 12 verses 43 through 47, we see the reason for the bones not being broken. Maybe not the reason, but the importance of that, the significance of that, maybe a better way of saying it, uh, goes back to the Passover meal being established. Uh, this is Exodus 12, 43 through 47. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner is to eat of it, but every man's slave purchased with money after you have circumcised him, then he may eat of it. A sojourner or a hired servant shall not eat of it. It is to be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside of the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. All the congregation of Israel are to celebrate this. And we noted in our observance of the Lord's Supper just this past Sunday at the Four Lakes congregation, Jesus is our Passover lamb. And I love that song that uh, Michael sometimes leads us in. He is the uh, expert in that song. That is, uh, I consider that Michael's song. He does a great job leading that. But in that song, we sang, When I see the blood, I will pass over you. So that's the reference there to Jesus being our Passover. So Jesus fulfilled this prophecy in his death on the cross. So even though the soldiers broke the legs of the criminals on his right and his left, uh, they did not break Jesus' legs. And this was a fulfillment of that prophecy from Psalm 34. And it also certainly reminds us that Jesus is our Passover, as Paul points out over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. All right, we've got another interesting prophecy from the Psalms. This one coming from Psalm 69. Psalm 69 verses 20 and 21. Psalm 69, 20 and 21. This is where David says, Reproach has broken my heart, and I am so sick, and I looked for sympathy, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Well, we have the fulfillment in all four gospel accounts, but we'll just briefly focus on a few little chunks from Matthew. This is Matthew 27, verses 33 and 34, and then also skipping down to verses 47 through 50. Matthew 27, 33 and 34. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. Okay, that's the first reference. And then skipping down to uh, Matthew 27, 47. 
And some of those who were standing there when they heard it began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Well, this shows us pretty clearly that uh, there were two times Jesus was offered some form of wine or drink on the cross. Uh, the first was mixed with gall. Uh, some scholars have speculated this was something uh, that they would mix together with a drink to maybe take the edge off of the pain, like a, a narcotic kind of thing. And so Jesus refused this after tasting it. My understanding is when he realized what it was, nope. I'm going to go through this with a uh, with completely sober, clear-headed. So as they were nailing him to the cross, they offered him that first one, and he refused that. But then, after having been hanging there on the cross for six hours, right there near the end, he accepts this sour wine. And I would note that it's tied to them not being able to understand what he was saying with the Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Sabachthani comment. So, you know, maybe... Uh, you know, his lips were dried and he couldn't speak. And so here, let's give him this and kind of see what he says next. See if this helps a little bit. And he does accept the uh, sour wine the uh, second time, uh, but apparently for the purpose of being able to get a few more words out right before he dies. But the, the point here is to note that the uh, references to gall and vinegar or sour wine are fulfilled in these passages. Okay, outside the book of Psalms, we've just hit a few highlights here. Let's go over to the book of Amos. We have a, an interesting prophecy in Amos chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. Amos 8, verses 9 and 10. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. Then I will turn your festivals into mourning and all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring sackcloth on everyone's loins, and baldness on every head, and I will make it like a time of mourning for an only son, and the end of it will be like a bitter day. Well, obviously, we see this fulfilled in Luke chapter 23, verses 44 and 45, with other references in Matthew and Mark as well. But Luke 23, 44, it was now about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour, because the sun was obscured, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. Well, if you've got a Bible with footnotes, you may notice the footnote tells us the sixth hour was noon. Uh, basically, six hours after sunrise, um, according to the way Romans divided up each day and the time that they that they um, used. And that we also know this would have interrupted the Passover celebration, which is mentioned in this prophecy in Amos, just as he predicted, I will turn your festivals into mourning, and, and so on. It will be like a time of mourning for an only son. And so if people who knew the scriptures had been paying attention, I think uh, many of them, if they had honest, open hearts, would have thought about this passage from Amos um, when the sun turned to darkness at noon on the day that Jesus was crucified. Uh, we don't have time to do an in-depth look at the whole chapter, but I want to at least for us to uh, look briefly at Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, this is a passage written more than 700 years before Jesus is born. We looked at a couple verses or a verse or so uh, a week or so ago. Uh, but let's look at Isaiah 53, just hit a few highlights as we move through this. Isaiah 53, verse 1, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearer, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off 
out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Again, we don't have time to look at this in a verse-by-verse way. We've done that before as we've studied through the prophet Isaiah, but I would just point out a a few highlights concerning prophecy, starting in verse 5, where we find that this suffering servant would be pierced through for our transgressions. Isn't that interesting? We just talked about that other um, piercing passage. Uh, We also have the reference here to being crushed, and I believe that would be an allusion back to that prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, where Satan's head would be crushed, but the Messiah's heel would be crushed. And then we have a reference to scourging. I mean, who could have predicted that? Uh, Then skipping down to verse 9, we have the reference to his grave being assigned with wicked men. And yet, he was with a rich man in his death. So there's a contrast here. As I understand this, as a criminal, Jesus should have just been thrown in a common grave with anybody else. Um, But we remember what actually happened, don't we? That is not what happened. He was not given a grave with the poor. But a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, stepped forward along with Nicodemus. And uh, Joseph asked for Jesus' body. And then it was buried in a rich man's tomb. And so... My understanding of this, this is the reference here being fulfilled. Uh, There are obviously other very significant references in this chapter, uh, but let's move on as we close to a prophecy concerning Jesus' resurrection. So we've spent most of our time on his death, but let's move forward to his resurrection. And we'll actually start with the New Testament on this one, going back to Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And I'm doing it this way just because Peter uh, quotes so well from Joel in the prophecy that we looked at several weeks ago about the kingdom. And he basically says, you people killed the son of God. I'm just paraphrasing a few verses here. You killed the Messiah. You killed the the, the Savior. And then we come to Acts 2 verse 24, where Peter says this, but God raised him up again putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exulted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay." You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that... He was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Well, on the screen, we have that quote from Psalm 16, 8 through 11, set off by the indented margin in all caps. I know the New American Standard likes putting those quotes from the Old Testament in all caps. So he's not shouting here. This isn't, you know, a, a rant online, but this is a, this is a direct quote from the Old Testament. So he's quoting a Psalm of David. And I hope we notice how Peter introduces this right before that little quote that's set off there with the all caps and the margins. He speaks of Jesus, and then in verse 25, Peter says, For David says of him, and then he quotes from Psalm number 16, and Peter then says that David was speaking of Jesus in that passage. And specifically, David was predicting Jesus' resurrection. Notice in the middle in verse 27, You will not abandon my soul to Hades nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. 
And this certainly fits in. This ties into what we've just finished studying in sermon form over the last few weeks on Sunday morning. When he died, Jesus went to Hades. And this is where we find that Hades seems to be the New Testament equivalent of Sheol, um, as David actually uses the word Sheol in Psalm 16. Uh, Sheol, or Hades, is simply the place of the dead. And when we look at several other passages, we seem to have two divisions in this place. So there are two um, sides of Sheol, or Hades, we might say. And, um, you know, there's a good place and a bad place. So there's a side for the lost, there's a side for the saved. One is a place of torment, the other is a place of comfort and rest. Uh, paradise is the good side of Hades. And remember, Jesus said to the thief on the cross beside him, Today you will be with me in paradise. And so contrary to popular opinion, contrary to some of those really old creeds that got it wrong, and certainly contrary to the King James Version and some of the other older translations, Jesus did not go to hell for three days. You know, 400 years ago, they didn't really understand this, that these are different concepts and different words that are used. Um, I don't want, to, don't want us to get uh, bogged down on this, though, because I, I think the point here is David predicted Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And this is how Peter applies this passage. In fact, he goes on to make the point, starting in verse 29, um, that King David is definitely not talking about himself in this passage. Because basically, as Peter says here, David is clearly dead. And uh, his tomb is right over there. You know, if you want to go look at David's rotting bones, I mean, they're in that place right, you know, down the road here kind of thing. That's I'm just paraphrasing what Peter is saying here. Uh, unlike Jesus who was not abandoned to Hades. So you can't go look at Jesus' body because he's no longer here. And his flesh certainly did not suffer decay. And that's the point that Peter is making. Well, this brings us to the end of our study of prophecy. Again, over the past few lessons, we've, I think, done a pretty good overview of predictive prophecy. I'm so thankful you've taken the time to be with us for this series We've defined some terms, we've looked at some principles of predictive prophecy, we've looked at some examples, and I uh, am certainly hoping that this has helped to strengthen our faith a bit. I mean, that is certainly the point of all of this. As we close this series, I'm going to share one more interesting passage as something of a concluding uh, summary or comment here. I've referred to this in our closing prayer a time or two over the past few weeks, although I've never really read it in the class. But it's a passage that's been on my mind as we've studied this over the past couple months. But the reference comes from Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10, where God says through Isaiah the prophet, Remember the former things long past, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God is unique because he has always been. God is eternal. He is everlasting. And he's able to declare the end from the beginning. He declares from ancient times those things which have not yet been done. And the passage here says that his purpose will be accomplished. And I think that's one of the big takeaways that we have uh, from this study of prophecy. We're now ready to move on to a study of Genesis next week, if the Lord wills. I am looking forward to this. It has been uh, many years since we've studied through the book of Genesis on a verse-by-verse -verse basis. Again, I am looking forward to it. I'm excited about this. Uh, I would encourage you to come prepared for a class next week, if you can, by reading Genesis chapter 1 at a minimum. Uh, this would be a great time to really to read through the whole book in one sitting if you're able to do that. I mentioned this a few weeks ago, and uh, one or two of you have mentioned that you've been working on that, and so maybe a work in progress for some of us. Um, I did it uh, through the audio on the app on the kind of the online or the app that I have on my phone for the New American Standard. There's a guy who reads it. And so I did that on my trip to Tennessee a month and a half ago. So you can listen to it. You can read through the book of Genesis. It should take about three and a half hours. So not bad at all. You know, take a morning, take an afternoon, an evening, or, you know, your commute on the way to work this week. And just uh, listen or read uh, the entire book of Genesis. But in the meantime, hope to see you this coming Sunday at 930 for class and 1030 for worship. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. 
Our Father in heaven, you are a God who declares the end from the beginning. And we're thankful tonight for your book. We're thankful for the prophecies that we've studied over the past several weeks. Thank you for your servants, the prophets. And we're thankful for their courage. And certainly we pray for their courage for us as we speak your truth to the world around us. Be with us as we move into a new study of the book of Genesis. We pray that we would come to a much deeper appreciation of who you are and what you have planned for us. Thank you for Jesus, your word, the perfect fulfillment of all prophecy. In Jesus we pray. Amen.